and welcome to the Media Center's Local Hero Awards series, in which we showcase six people from the Mid Peninsula for outstanding achievement or contributions to the community. We solicited nominations and were especially looking for the unsung heroes. Each winner is an inspiration and each has a great story to tell. Being a teenager has never been easy, but being a teenager in Silicon Valley in 2019 is arguably more difficult than ever. For more than 20 years, Dr. Philippe Ray has been the executive director of Adolescent Counseling Services, a local nonprofit that addresses youth challenges with four cutting edge programs. Community counseling in Palo Alto, on-site counseling at local schools, and also two programs, which are the only ones on the peninsula providing their services, intensive outpatient substance abuse treatment and LGBTQ mental health clinical support for teens and family members. Philippe brings a deeply personal perspective to his work, having struggled with some of the same traumatic experiences now facing the youth he works with. He shares his personal experiences openly as a passionate advocate for more awareness and less stigma around mental health issues. Philippe, I gather you grew up in a perfect little family in an idyllic uh, Swiss village. Tell me about your life when you were a child. So I basically grew up in a place very far away from here, so French-speaking Switzerland, and to the outside world, it looked like the perfect childhood. Uh, so during the winter, you would find me uh, skiing up and down the Alps. Summer, I'd be uh, swimming at uh, lakes and streams. And uh, as I said, to the outside world, it was completely perfect, perfect family life. Yet once our front door to our home uh, was closed, it was a completely different story. So when I was a young boy, my older sister started developing a substance abuse problem. And basically, I watched her struggle with it and not really understanding what was going on with her. I would be uh, observing the behavior, feeling that there was something wrong with her. And that left me very uh, confused and, and very uh, scared because I didn't understand it. And then I also watched my parents not deal with it. Mm. Uh, so basically, uh, I watched them uh, avoid the conversation. And, and, and the, the main thing that was happening in my family is what I now call the uh, code of silence, where we never talked about anything that had to do with emotions. So as you can imagine, as a young kid, it, it left me very isolated, very uh, scared, uh, because we never talked about anything. So then, uh, f uh, some years later, when I started questioning my sexuality around age 12, uh, I knew that my family, because of this code of silence, was not the place where I could say at the dinner table, hey, mom, dad, I think I'm gay. Wow. So what basically happened is I really stuffed it in. Uh, I really uh, denied that part of myself. I was so scared. Uh, I was also feeling a lot of shame, which was part of the family. Uh, I think dynamics then because I know my parents were feeling a lot of shame too because of what my sister was going through so I was also uh, struggling with the, with internal shame that there was something possibly wrong with me that I was attracted to boys so what that left me ultimately was very alone very isolated uh, I suffered from depression uh, lots of anxiety and at times even thought about killing myself how did you know even that you were suffering from depression I think it's the feeling, it's, it's something that's internal. You, you look at life, I mean, again, uh, going back to this idea of growing up in the perfect world, I mean, this is the middle of the Alps. You're looking at the Matterhorn, yet internally you feel so sad. And, and, and it, f it feels like there's this dark cloud, this dark, uh, I, w I would almost describe it as you see life in black and white. So all the mm -hmm. colors are gone. And, and everything closes around your vision and your feelings and your emotions. Uh, so it's almost like tunnel vision uh, in black and white. And it's, it's quite, quite devastating and, and, and scary as a, as a young kid. What did you do about it? Uh, 
I think what what I always I always uh, uh, thank or, or or I'm grateful to two individuals in my life. Uh, one of them, uh, and, 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 and those two individuals are the reason why I'm here today and that I'm able to basically sit with you and, and be part of the community and helping other youth, is the first individual is, is, is this woman who used to time her walk on my way to school daily, and she would, she would walk her dog. And it, looks, it, it looked completely by, by chance, but I was looking forward to those walks and seeing her. And, and casually, she, was at, she would engage me in conversation uh, about my skiing, school topics, how I was doing. And that became a daily routine, and I was so expecting, I was, I was so looking forward to those walks because all of a sudden, I felt like I matter, I existed, somebody sees me. Uh, yeah. I have a place here. And then the other person was at school. I had a teacher that did the exact same thing, who basically made me the king of her classroom. She made me this individual asked a lot of questions. And, and again, it's going back to this feeling of, of being felt uh, valued, f being felt like uh, I existed. I had, I had a sense of purpose in the world. So in both cases, y y you were talking to a relative, not stranger, but somebody who was not intimate mm -hmm. to you, like yes. a family member, and you weren't going to them saying, I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. These were fairly superficial conversations, and yet they had a huge effect on you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I, I credit those two individuals for uh, basically giving me another chance at life and looking at another day uh, and not any at all. Uh, it was so important just to have. And now going back to my role uh, as, as the Executive Director of Adolescent Counseling Services and what I tell many, many people is, you know, you have no idea what an eye contact and a just a, a, a simple good morning, good afternoon, how are you? When you go to the store and you walk on your, on your daily walks to a youth, because that could save somebody's life. Wow. Yeah. Um, you then went to college mm -hmm. and uh, carried all this with you, both the, the trauma and the, the saving. Um, what happened there and how did that change you? Well, uh, so moving from Switzerland, uh, uh, again, my, my idea was to get as far away as possible. Uh, I, was, I wanted to discover the world. I wanted a different culture, a different adventure. So coming to California, going to San Diego, University of California, San Diego, what really helped me there is that I could basically explore my own sense of identity of who I was, who I was becoming, and, and without having the the cultural and or the community uh, awareness of, of, of who I was in that community. And, and one of the reasons I always say uh, that it's not uh, by chance that I ended up working in Palo Alto because Palo Alto, and I would say the Mid-Peninsula, reminds me a lot of home and, and, and the atmosphere, the, the community that, that I grew up in. So very uh, uh, stressful community, very driven community, a lot of success. Uh, w w uh, expectations were put on us as kids. So coming here, and, and when I hear the youth that we help and we support, I always go back and say or think, well, this is no different than what I grew up uh, in. So, so this idea of having my, separating myself from you know, my, my father's name and my family's reputation to then work on my own identity uh, also really helped me uh, because then I was free to explore areas of my life uh, of who I was without having that uh, instant recognition, you're the son of. Or, or your parents own, you know, restaurants and, and, and businesses. Right. We know who you are. So, so, so that 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 um, what do you call that? The, the anonymity, I mm -hmm. think, also mm -hmm. really helped me. Um, so, um, apart from the two individuals you mentioned who mm -hmm. helped you, obviously, it takes a little bit more than that mm -hmm. to to accomplish a major mm -hmm. change. Um, and I gather there was not like a big aha moment in college, but what you called a controlled release in mm -hmm. which things kind of shifted mm -hmm. 
Tell me how that happened. Well, I think the beauty of, of uh, knowing now what I kn knowing now what what happened with my family, especially with my sister's substance abuse and mental illness, I believe that I was the psychologist of the family, uh, even mm. as as a young kid. Uh, I was put into that role, but I also chose that role. So for me to choose uh, uh, psychology as a major was again not it was it wasn't luck. I mean, it's something that I wanted to do, and through the process, uh, I would say mostly with graduate school, so in my master's and doctorate, uh, you're basically forced to confront yourself. Uh, so through the literature, through the research, and then also back back then uh, when I was in graduate school, we were also required to uh, seek therapy on our own. So we had to go into individual therapy as well as group therapy. Um, so, so that also allowed me to work on myself and, and go back to my history and family of origin and then get strong. Uh, so the outcome was getting strong. Was mm -hmm. it sheer torture getting there? Was it, was it really difficult or, or not? I would think it would be. There were some times, yes. Uh, I would say especially with uh, my own coming out. Uh -huh. uh, because again, I think this, this, this carrying this, this sense of shame uh, and, and, and what amazes me, and, and, and now still working with our outlet program, uh, you know, how empowering LGBTQ youth, it's amazing how much the internal, the self-shame, the self-questioning uh, affects individuals still. Uh, I mean, you would think that uh, even, even in a progressive area like Mid Peninsula, the Bay Area, where we th you would think that, uh, you know, coming out as LGBTQ would be so easy, uh, sadly, we hear from our youth in our programs that 60% uh, of them still report feeling unsafe at school. So there's still a lot of bullying, teasing, singled really? out. And about 40% of them uh, report to us that they feel unsafe or live in an in a, uh, unsafe home environment. And I think it's all from, again, it's, it's, it's your own internal thing, but also if you look at the politics currently, uh, you know, uh, the politics and religion and all those rules that are putting on, as a young kid, as you're developing, as you're growing, you're hearing mostly that who you are is not right, who you are is wrong. You should, you know, the, 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 the rule of, you know, men, women, uh, mm -hmm. having kids, the whole thing, and that homosexuality, and then, then now, uh, you know, even a step further with, uh, you know, transgender, uh, you're adding another uh, dimension of, of stigma and, and, and pressure. How do you, for the people you work with, how do you remove that? Uh, again, it's working with the internal that they are okay, you are okay uh, with, who, with who you are and what you, who you want to love or, or, or questioning gender or your sexuality. But it's, an, it, it's enough for you to, to say that to mm -hmm. me. How do I internalize that? Or how do you get me to internalize it? Role modeling. I think I think what's what's missing, what was missing in my life, were were uh, prominent role models mm -hmm. in society, in the arts, in, in in politics, in 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 industries, in as CEOs. I mean, yes, we have Tim Cook as the CEO of Apple, but we need more people so then young kids can look up to them and say, "Oh, here's a role model that doesn't fit the stereotype." So when I grew up, m what I knew about the LGBTQ world was mostly, you know, the, the, either the, the, the gay men murderer or the drag queens, you know, I mean, there was no positive role model. So, so mm -hmm. we're seeing a little change, but I think we, we need more. And this is why I strive and make it a, a, a mission of mine to come out, mm -hmm. to let people know, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm gay. And, and, and you can be successful, you can, be to you can, you can have a total happy life uh, for, for, for youth to see that it's possible, it's not just the negatives. Now you said something a minute ago about um, feeling you're not good enough mm -hmm. a as a gay. Couldn't that or doesn't that apply to other things just in general, especially in this area, feeling you're not good enough? Oh, absolutely. I think we live, and again this is going back to my own childhood uh, in the community, there is such a sense of pressure of, of, of striving to be perfect. So it doesn't really matter. And we see that with all of our youth. So it's not just the LGBTQ youth. It's also our, our, uh, in, in our school programs. There's this idea that I need to be better. I need to do more. I need to, to have better grades, more money, bigger house. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's becoming to a point where it's, it's almost impossible. 
uh, or, or it is impossible. How, how significant are the differences um, between the stressors um, in the wealthier community and the more disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged communities? I think they're, they're the same. Uh, mm. uh, amazingly enough, we see uh, when it comes to pressure to, to or, or academic pressure, pressure to succeed, uh, I think the advantaged community, they have the, again, the, the advantage of having the wealth. So it, it is completely easier and it's a completely different story. What I've realized or what I've discovered with adolescent counseling services, and we do a lot of parent education uh, mm -hmm. in the communities, uh, is that sadly the more affluent communities spend less time realizing and understanding what's needed in terms, for, in terms of their kids uh, uh, reaching maturity or understanding development. I think there's a lot of uh, attention that's put to uh, materialistic. Uh, so, so, so perfect example. We'll have parents coming coming to us and say, "Well, how can my daughter or son be depressed? Because we've given them all. Mm -hmm. We take them on, on vacation to Europe. They go skiing. They, you know, they have the latest iPad, iPhone. You know, the technologies and gadgets. And then on the other side, uh, in the, the the more disadvantaged communities, we actually see. Uh, more awareness of the normal development of of of, of children and and there's an, and the, the, I always use an example because that happened in uh, it was one day uh, at at adolescent counseling services so we had in the morning we had uh, young women uh, high school student who we actually had to uh, put together a team to support because she was on the brink of ending her life because all that her family could afford was a brand new Honda Civic and mm -hmm. she wanted to kill herself. And, and then on the other side, in, in one of our other school side, we had a kid from East Palo Alto who had watched his dad being shot the night before. And when we worked with that kid, we were like, we did you know suicide assessment, depression assessment, and that kid basically said to us, no, I'm not, I don't wanna kill, uh, kill myself, I need to, quit school so I can find another job to put food on the table for my younger siblings. Uh, and, and, and these are, you know, two, two incidents. So I'm not saying that the affluent community, uh, you know, there's this term of affluenza uh, right, right. going around and that less, less affluent communities. But again, it's the reality of what we deal here. But I think it all goes back to this idea of perfection and the need to be perfect and successful. So, what is the common theme um, insofar as the, what you offer mm -hmm. to these two people that, that maybe they're not getting elsewhere? Uh, well, we have, uh, I'll start with our niche programs. Uh, so, as an organization, so we've been around since 1975, we are the only organization uh, in the, uh, I would say, between south of, of, of San Francisco to maybe, yeah, to San Jose, uh, that offers an intensive outpatient uh, program for teens, youth who are struggling with uh, substance abuse. So it's an intensive program. So it's, the, it's basically the last step before uh, hospital, uh, hospitalization. Uh, and and what what the key to the success of that program is we keep the kids the youth in the community So they still go to the same school. They still live with their parents So they're not removed and you know shipped mm. over to Utah or to a wilderness program or hospitalized somewhere So they're still part of the community uh, and their school. So that's 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 ongoing uh, and and that's, is that necessarily better? You, there's a oh, lot of absolutely. argument. You really? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and but again, keep in mind that those those youth also come to us up to four times a week. So every mm -hmm. evening after school, they're with us working on their recovery. Uh, and and then it's the, not hard for them to to go back and forth. No, no, because what what usually happens is is I would say the first three months they they let us they they tell us it's hard. Uh, because again, there's a lot of denial. There's a lot mm -hmm. of, of, of they don't really want to get into treatment or to really start working on their treatment. Once the three months mark is passed, we actually have, have, have youth who are looking forward to being with us. The other key to the success of that program is uh, we involve the family. So mom, dad, guardians, whoever is important in that child's life is required to be part of the program. So, so we treat the entire family. We, don't, we don't, just don't treat the, the, the individual struggling with uh, substance abuse. What do you see as the, the main causes of substance abuse 
among the youth? Well, again, substance abuse is only a symptom. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think a lot of people are forgetting that. Uh, once we start working and supporting a youth, uh, there will be a lot of underlying causes, so depression, anxiety. Uh, there might be trauma that has, has happened in their life, and then they mask it or deal with it through the use of substances. Uh, on the other side, too, the, the uh, academic pressure, the, the pressure to succeed, we also see a link to that with uh, especially with the use of speed, where we have youth right. who, you know, because they need to have the A++ on the test, they will find something that will keep them up all night so they can, they can study. What do you most want parents to know about all of this that you wish they knew? Oh, let your kid be a kid. Let your kid get dirty. Let your kid, and, and when I say dirty, I mean let your kid play, climb trees, Play in the mud. Let your kid have downtime. I think that's so important. Uh, you know what's so really sad is, is you, you walk through our communities, through our streets, and you don't you don't hear kids playing anymore. You don't hear the laughter, the screaming of of happy kids. Everybody's indoors, and everybody or or mm -hmm. with a tablet. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's another sense that that we see we see more and more. We see isolated youth. Uh, I mean, the first question we ask is, how many friends do you have? And, and the answer is always, well, 1,000, right, 1,500. On <laughs> and then we go, well, <laughs> where? And they're like, well, Facebook, you know, Instagram, I mean, the whole thing. And then we say, well, how about a friend that you can actually get in trouble with, or you can share a book, or you can be in the same room and, and just be? Sadly, uh, lately, the answer is zero. I mean, wow. we, we start seeing kids who, who have no contact uh, with other uh, friends physically uh, wow. in, in one room. It's all, it's all online. So um, it's my sense that there are some um, youth problems and parent youth problems that are eternal, age old. Mm -hmm. There are others that are new. Mm -hmm. What are the old ones that are still there mm -hmm. and what are the new ones? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the generational uh, gap, it's something that's been going on since the, the, the beginning of, of times, is things are evolving so fast that even if you're a young parent, by the time your kids reach school age, uh, everything has changed. So the way math are being taught, the way science is being taught is completely different. So there's a, there's a, there, there's a breach or there's a gap in terms of the understanding of what our youth is going through. Uh, uh, what's really changing and where we're really concerned about is, is and this is the new, our, our new crisis at Adolescent Counseling Services is the, the vaping and, and nicotine addiction epidemics. We're starting to see uh, a, a rate of addiction to, to nicotine in middle school that's, that's uh, very alarming. Uh, we are, as an organization, putting together uh, a, a, a program right now that we are offering to public schools that will start in the fall uh, to actually address the, the, this crisis. But it's, 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 it's amazing. Those kids mm. are hooked. And I don't know if you remember, we used to say uh, that marijuana was the gateway to uh, harder drugs. Now what we say is nicotine is actually the gateway to harder drugs. Wow. I mean, those kids are hooked, and it's, it's, it's a psychologic, uh, psychological um, dependence as well as a behavioral. Um, so you're dealing with a lot. Mm -hmm. um, day after day, you keep, you keep going back for more. What part of this is the most fulfilling? What keeps you going back day after day? Knowing that when I go to sleep, a kid, if, even if it's just one, because of the support of Adolescent Counseling Services, was able to say, I'm going to try one more day. That's what gives me, gives me around. And, and, and again, it's going back to this idea. That those kids are feeling so isolated. I mean, the isolation uh, is amazing. So for, for us to be around, to be that, that, that those, those two individuals that I talked to you at the beginning, I mean, what, what those two women did to me is that they allowed me to make the choice of saying, I will try one more day. And this is what, who I am today. I'm, I'm those two women. Adolescent Counseling Services is those two women. We are there uh, to, to, to make sure that, 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 that we tell those kids, hold on one more day, you know, and then another day and another day. So that's what keeps me, and, and that's what has kept me uh, with that organization for now 21 years. Yeah. I love it. Uh, well, we're out of time. 
congratulations mm -hmm. on the award and thanks so much well, for thank coming. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know someone who has overcome significant hardship and has an inspiring story to tell? Someone who has sacrificed or given over and above to the community and deserves some recognition? If so, please contact us with your nomination for next year's Local Hero Awards. To find out more about our local heroes and to watch interviews with all the winners, visit our website, midpenmedia.org. At the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center, you can make your own videos and television programs and take classes in all aspects of media production. You can also hire our professional services team. To find out more about that, go to mcproservices.com. Congratulations to all our winners, and thank you for watching. <laughs>